Okay, so um, hopefully you learn, those of you that didn't already know, learn about the Madden Julian Oscillation, what it was and how it might impact weather in the tropics and in the extratropics um, last week. Uh, today I'm going to talk about modelling the MJO. Um, I'm, going, I'm not really going to go back into what the MJO is or anything like that. So um, if you want a refresher on that now, stick your hand up. So the MJO, Eastward Propagating Organised Convection in the Tropics, um, has a period somewhere between 30 and 60 days. Um, the convection is most active over the Indian Ocean and West Pacific Warm Pool. Um, but it has sort of Influences on the convection over South America and Africa as well. Um, the heating anomalies associated with the MJO excite Rossby waves, which propagate into the extratropics and have influences on, particularly strong influences on the weather over North America, but also affect the North Atlantic um, and the southern annular mode, so variability over um, New Zealand or South America. Um, and it's very closely associated with active break phases of the Indian monsoon, uh, the Australian monsoon, for example. And it's a major mode of variability in, on subseasonal time scales in the tropics, and it's probably our largest source of predictability on subseasonal time scales in the tropics. So, given that, it would be really nice if our GCMs that we use for weather prediction on these timescales were capable of simulating the MJO well. So that's what I'm going to discuss today. Um, I'll say a little bit about the history of modelling the MJO, um, and then I'll talk about um, the, the challenges that we face and why it's a difficult thing to do. Um, and as part of that, I'll give two examples of process studies based on work that we've done at Reading, but, um, but they're, they're things that are done widely in the community. I mean, many people will have done studies similar to this in, in one way or another. I'll talk a little bit about high-resolution modelling of the MJO, and you might have heard something about that last week. I think you had a talk on high-resolution modelling last week, but I didn't see what was in it, so I don't know. And then I'll talk a little bit about the MJO in current subseasonal prediction systems. Okay, so we don't have a very good track record on modelling the MJO in our climate models. Um, and it's that's been going on for many, many years. So the, the first sort of really comprehensive assessment of MJO in climate models was a paper by Julia Slingo. Oh, dear, wrong buttons. A paper by Julia Slingo. And she analysed 15 GCMs that, that participated in the AMIP project. Um, the well, the first model into comparison project. So for those of you that are not familiar with model, the AMIP and CMIP activities, they have a very strange numbering. Um, I'd missed out four altogether, and AMIP 1 and 2 became CMIP 3, so it's, it's all a bit confusing. Um, but they found that um, most of the models weren't able to capture some of the essential features of the MJO, um, its period, its amplitude, or even any evidence of eastward propagation. Um, what they did note in their paper was that the best models... Uh, tended to have convection schemes closed on buoyancy rather than moisture convergence. And perhaps I'll uh, maybe I'll come back to that in a little bit. So how many people know how a convection scheme works? Adrian does, yes, I'm glad he does. Okay, so perhaps I need to say something about convection schemes then. Um, didn't really think about that beforehand. So uh, basically, most convection schemes, these days anyway, uh, work on the basis of um, you have some model of a convective plume or an ensemble of convective plumes that uh, take water vapour and temperature out of the boundary layer and transport it vertically through the model. And you kind of 
modelling it a bit like um, the plume of an individual cloud, but you're trying to represent an ensemble of clouds. Um, and the mass that goes up is compensated for by subsidence in the environment. And the combination of the subsidence in the environment and mixing from the cloud to the environment gives you um, the tendency on temperature and moisture on the large scale environment that's designed to represent the effects of convective clouds. Um, and so you, the core of a convection scheme has two things. One is how do you model the plume going up? And then how do you decide how much mass is going up in the plume? And the closure is the bit that decides how much mass is going up in the plume. So there are ways of, of closing it. Um, so often these days it's closed um, to try and remove the cape in the profile over a given time scale. Um, but other closures include um, closing it on the amount of moisture convergence in the boundary layer. Or um, sometimes, especially in the old days, it was closed on the amount of buoyancy that a parcel has lifted um, over a small part of the plume, over the lower part of the plume. Um, so the closure scheme and changing the rate at which you, you know, remove the cape or the, the, the amount of mass that goes up in a plume is one way you can control the strength of convection in, in climate models. Um, it's, it's not a simple way to do it because you twist the lever to make it remove the mass and the whole system adjusts. And so you don't get what you expect generally. So anyway, Julia and others found that schemes closed on buoyancy rather than moisture convergence did better. And remember that. Um, they also found that models with a better representation of the mean state precipitation uh, tended to simulate a better MJO. And this was in the early days when climate models were still actually quite poor at representing many features of the, the mean state in the tropics. They're still quite poor, but perhaps not as poor as they were 20 years ago. So, 10 years later, um, Lynn et al. did ex virtually the same kind of study on 14 models in the CMIP3 database. Um, they found that most models had less than half the observed variance in the MJO part of the spectrum. Uh, they were unable to capture the eastern propagation of the MJO, so we haven't really improved since 1996. Um, However, they note that the best two performing models have closures or trigger functions that depend on moisture convergence. Schemes closed on buoyancy rather than moisture convergence did best. And that's quite a nice summary of how much understanding we have of what you do to a convection scheme to make your MJO better, I think. Is that in the 10 years, um, our belief about what, what worked best has changed. Um, so later, Hung et al., 2013, compared CMIP5 models. So this is actually the next one from CMIP3 because there was no CMIP4. Um, and they actually found that there was a general improvement in the simulation of the MJO. There was more variance in the models. Um, the relationship between the eastward and westward moving power had improved, so more models simulated some form of eastward propagation. But they still argued that only one in 20 models was really able to simulate re the, a realistic propagation of the MJO. So there's still some way to go in climate models. So why is it, why is it so difficult? Well, the MJO relies very strongly on the interaction between the convection and the planetary scale dynamics. I mean, the MJO is a planetary scale oscillation, 10,000 kilometer length scale oscillation. Um, tropical convection happens on virtually every scale from individual clouds all the way up through mesoscale systems, and is, but it's organized on the scale of the planetary scale MJO as well. Um, and we rely on the convective and other parameterizations, the boundary layer, the cloud scheme, the radiation scheme, etc., to represent these smaller scales and essentially trust that they will interact with the large-scale dynamics in the right way. So this idea about the, the convection organized across many scales is, is, is maybe one of the reasons why we struggle to do this. So this is a picture, um, satellite picture from 
during the Toga Corps period, which is an observational field campaign in 92-93. And this is the, sort of a large-scale satellite Im IR image of the MJO. And you can see the organised convection associated with the active phase of the MJO and then a region of suppressed convection behind it. Um, if we zoom in on this box, um, this is a sort of false colour IR image, and you can see within this large organised system, there are still many different scales of convective organisation. So we're now sort of 2,000 kilometre scale. If we zoom in on this box here and look at just what looks like one, you know, one feature in the, at this resolution in this image, we can see that even this feature has got lots of scales of organisation in it. Um, so this is you know, about the size of a climate model grid box. It's many NWP model grid boxes. Um, so this is, this is kind of the thing that we're trying to parameterise in a climate model. Um, but it's got to interact with the systems that are going on here and on, on these large scales in, in a good way. This is just over the ocean. This is, um, this is pretty much um, over the IMET boy region, I think. I think. Oh, no, maybe not, because this is the equator here, so the IMET boy would have been down here, just north of the boy. Um, so, you know, this interaction between convection and the large-scale dynamics is why this is a difficult problem to do. So what aspects of the convection might be important for the MJO? Um, well, we don't actually know, I don't think. Um, there are a number of properties of the convection which we think might be important, um, and for various different reasons. Uh, so uh, there have been a, a series of papers that argue that the, the stratiform heating of the part of the convection, so this is convection in the upper atmosphere that you tend to get stronger heating in large organised Mises scale systems in that region. Uh, might be important because the vertical profile of the heating essentially determines the, the characteristics of the waves, the planetary scale waves that the convection triggers. So this might be important in determining the phase speed of the MJO and providing you know, energy for growth. Um, a number of papers have suggested that the shallow heating that you get ahead of the convection, the active phase of the convection, might be important because this shallow heating drives quite strong moisture convergence, more moisture convergence than is required to maintain the precipitation associated with that heating. So that can moisten the atmosphere, so that might be important. Um, it might be that the shallow convection actually moistens the environment directly, and there's some evidence that you take moisture out of the boundary layer, it goes up in the shallow clouds, some of it rains out, but most of it is just evaporated again in the into the environment, and that moistens the lower environment, and that might be important for promoting convection. Um, and actually, just how sensitive the convection is to the environmental humidity might be important. So if you imagine you've got this plume going up, and if it's going up through a very dry environment, it entrains lots of dry air into the plume, and that reduces the buoyancy of the cloud, and so the convection won't penetrate as deeply, maybe. But if it goes up through a moist environment, it's entraining lots of moist air and can remain buoyant for longer. And so that might be an important aspect of the convection. It is entirely likely that no single one of these will determine the quality of your MJO simulation in a model. Because even if you do something to modify this, you're almost certainly modifying this and this and this at the same time. And so it's very difficult to actually really pin down why we've improved our simulation if we do improve our simulation. Okay, so what's the current status of MJO modelling? So this is, um, this is about comparable to the CMIP-5 study. It's a little bit later than that. And this is some results from a, a big international intercomparison project to not only assess the quality of MJO simulations in our models, but, but try and understand why some models do better than others. So this is 27 simulations from 24 different models. And the way I've plotted this here is that I, I've plotted the, a regression of the intraseasonal precipitation, so 20 to 100 day band pass precipitation, against a base point in the Indian Ocean. Um, and so this is what that looks like in observation. So this is the base point, and you can see nice eastward propagating signal in the um, enhanced precipitation and the 
um, suppressed precipitation following behind it. No, this is suppressed precipitation ahead of it. So this is time going up on this. So you've got a suppressed phase and an active phase, and then the suppressed phase follows. Um, and this is uh, how all the models did. So you can see most of them still suffer from this problem of uh, no real coherent signal on these time scales. Um, some have a westward propagating signal. Uh, some look fairly stationary. And then there are a few that have eastward propagating signals. About a quarter of them have something that looks a little bit like an MJO in one way or another. Um, so two of those models are the superparameterized uh, version of the community atmosphere model. So this replaces all its subgrid parameterization schemes by running a cloud resolving model uh, in every grid box to produce its tendencies. So this is the most expensive convective parameterization in the world. It's about a thousand times more expensive than running just an ordinary convection parameterization scheme. The model is about, well, these days it's only about 10 times slower than a climate model because we can parallelize it quite nicely. But um, it's, it's a lot more expensive in the way of a convective parameterization scheme. And this is a version of uh, the same model where they've imposed a vertical structure of the heating from um, observations based on the diagnosed phase of the MJO in the model. So they're cheating. They're, yeah, well, <laughs> they're, yes, they've cheated in a way. They've replaced their convective, they've actually, in a way, what they've done is they've said, we're going to replace one aspect of our convective parameterization, that is the vertical profile of the heating, by an empirical relationship with the phase of the MJO. But it's not the observed phase of the MJO. It's not the observed phase of the MJO. It's the model simulated phase of the MJO. Um, the other interesting aspect is the sensitivity to air-sea interaction. So this is the atmosphere-only version of SPCAM, and this is the coupled version of SPCAM. Um, and that's a much better MJO. So this is the atmosphere-only version of the CNRM model. Um, this is a coupled version of that model. Um, but this coupled version has a much, you know, very big changes to the basic state SSTs in the model. So we asked them to rerun it with using the SSTs from the coupled model um, in an atmosphere-only configuration, and this is what you get. So this is really quite a nice demonstration that it's the role of the AC interaction that has improved the MJO, not changing the basic state. Um, so in terms of trying to understand why, so Zhang et al. found no systematic relationship between the MJO fidelity and the basic state. So that's different from that Slingo et al. paper. And I think that's largely because overall the basic state has improved. And so um, the the what, what you were finding very early on was that if you had a really poor basic state, probably meant you had a bad model, generally. So you didn't do a very good job of the MJO either. Whereas now, um, the basic state in most models is much better. And so you're, you're not sampling really bad basic state models in quite the same way as you were. Um, they found no systematic relationship between the partitioning of the convection between large-scale and convective Rain. And this, is, this has been sort of related sometimes to this relationship between convective and stratiform precipitation. Be very, very aware that that is not the case. Um, it's just the way your model partitions its um, precipitation. But it might have an impact on why you simulate an MJO better or not. So Adrian, some while ago, had a look at, at the role of this partitioning on equatorial waves in the ECMWF model um, and found that because the large scale rain is ultimately tied to the vertical velocity, whereas the convective rain isn't necessarily tied to that, then the partitioning between these two things can change where the heating occurs in the phase of the wave and that can affect the wave growth. But it is not the partitioning between convective and stratiform part of rain in convection. Um, and no systematic relationship with the vertical profile of the diabetic heating. So that was a bit disappointing. 
they did find relationships between MJO fidelity and a couple of sort of growth measures of climate models. So one was the relationship between precipitation and relative humidity. So you may have seen observational studies that show this nice exponential growth of precipitation with uh, sort of column relative humidity. Um, and they, they looked at something that was, was sort of similar to that and found that those that basically had, um, well, they argue, and I'm an author on this paper, but I don't necessarily agree with the argument <laughs> that's made in the paper overall, is that th this measure is sort of representing the sensitivity of the convection to environmental humidity. I think it's actually indicating whether the models are able to make a better dynamic range of humidity across their simulations. Um, and then something called the growth moist stability, which some of you may be familiar with, but is basically a measure of how efficient convection is at removing, um, and the resulting circulation is at removing moist static energy from the column. So this is about how much moisture is exported from, or imported to the into the column when you have a convective, um, you know, convection going on compared to how much dry static energy is exported or cooling of the column goes on associated with that vertical motion. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, so that's, that's, that's entirely appropriate in the boundary layer or something like that maybe, but outside of the boundary layer, the, the tropical atmosphere doesn't have a constant relative humidity. Um, it, it, it can vary between... The, 50% and 100% in the, in, the, in the sort of tropical atmosphere on interseasonal time scale. It may or may not be more appropriate approximation on a, if you're thinking about a climate change time scale. It's going to be roughly the same, 70% on climate time scales, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, right. So, there were a number of studies looking at the relationship between MJO fertility and aspects of the representation of the convection, either in these large model intercomparison projects, which generally tend to find nothing in terms of a systematic relationship. And if they do, it doesn't necessarily agree with the systematic relationship that was found in other studies, or by perturbing some aspect of the model physics rather than comparing different models. So very often these studies don't draw the same conclusions. And very often, the relationships that they find are between sort of growth properties of the model, i.e. this normalised growth moist stability or the relative humidity di diagnostic. And they're very often not directly relatable to the formulation of the physical parameterization. And so that, although they tell you something about, if I have a model that looks like this, in this particular way or this particular way, then I ha might have a good MJO. It doesn't tell you what you have to do to your parameterization scheme to make it behave more like that. Okay. So I'm going to change tack here and talk about two sensitivity experiments that we've done at the University of Reading. One is the sensitivity to convective entrainment. So this is how much does my plume mix with its environment as it goes up? Um, there are a number of studies that have done this in various ways, um, as early as 1988, for example. Um, the Spectold and the Hirons paper are changes that were made at ECMWF during the, well, possibly just after Adrian was there, but maybe about the same time as Adrian was there, that had a very big, big impact on the MJO simulation in their monthly forecasting systems. Um, and this is the one that I'm going to talk about. So we perform uh, some experiments in the Met Office Unified Model because th before we started, this is what the Met Office Unified Model's MJO looked like, climate model looked like, compared to observations. So these are composites in the phase space of the Wheeler-Hendon um, diagram, which I think Hylin would have introduced you to last week. So the MJO on, on average will, will propagate around in this direction and slowly decay into the middle, and this is just for composites starting in each of the eight phases of the MJO. So this is what observations look like in that diagram, and this is what the Met Office model looked like in that diagram. You can see that very quickly the MJO decays, and it doesn't really propagate very well. Um, 
So we tried a number of experiments in some hindcasts, actually, to explore the sensitivity of, um, to various parameters. And convection, convective entrainment is the one I'll focus on because it is the one that had the biggest systematic impact. So this is for an MJO event during um, the year of tropical convection. You can see the eastward propagating precipitation signal um, and eastward propagating signals in the winds. And this is how the Met Office model simulated that event. Very little eastward propagation in the precipitation or in the winds. Not a very good simulation. And this is this, this event in Wheeler Hendon phase space. So we start here and it goes around like that. And we're initialising it somewhere here, actually, I think. Um, so if we change a number of parameters, which we, what we did, we, one of them was the convective entrainment parameter. And this is now the simulation of that event. And you can see right, a much, much better simulation of the MJO in this sort of Hofmuller diagram. And I'm sorry there's too many lines on here because I only really want you to look at two. One is the red line, which is this control simulation with the low entrainment. And one is the blue line, which is this high entrainment simulation. And you can see that there, in, in this sort of phase space diagram, there's a much better simulation of the MJO. Um, the other two were where we changed the convective or switched the convective momentum transport off. And that actually improved the simulation in both of those cases for this MJO event. But when we tried it over many MJO events, it didn't really have a systematic effect one way or another. Um, so we did that for many hindcasts. And this, these are the composites for those hindcasts. And you can see that increasing the entrainment has... Uh, quite a substantial impact on MJO simulation in this model. So what happens if we go back and put that in the climate model? Um, so this is what happens if we put it in the climate model. And you can see that although we're still not capturing fully the, the, the low length of these, sort of all the, the amplitude of these composites all the way through, we have a much better simulation of the MJO in our climate model, model now than we had originally, and we can see that you know, generally the f it's still outside the um, unit circle five days into the simulation, and the propagation is sort of much more, more reasonable around the diagram. Um, okay, so that's some um, sensitivity to convective entrainment, and you know, this isn't the first study that has shown that this is the case in models, generally. Um, so perhaps before we go on, one aspect I will say, though, is that very often these models and many other modelling studies where you improve the representation of the MJO by perturbing the, the way the convection scheme is either sensitive to envir the environmental humidity or um, inhibition at low levels, improves the MJO but makes your climate model basic state, mean state, slightly worse. And if you think about the entrainment change, um, if, you, if you make the parcel entrain more as it goes up, what it tends to do is make the convection not quite go so deep in your model, for example. And that means that you need to have a slightly colder upper troposphere to get your convection to go deep enough to be able to balance the radiative cooling in the upper troposphere. So you tend to get cold biases um, at the upper, you know, at the tropopause level. And if you're a national met agency trying to forecast upper tropospheric winds, that can have quite a bad, for civil aviation and things like that, that can have quite a bad impact on that. Adrian? Yeah. Okay, so we'll move off from convective parameterization. So the role of air sea interaction. So again, 1988, Krishnamurti identified a relationship between atmospheric intraseasonal variability and oceanic variability on intraseasonal timescales over the Indian Ocean and West Pacific region. Um, not a lot was done with that, apart from maybe it was part of the motivation for the Toga Core field campaign, which was this large field campaign in um, the winter of 92-3. Um, which really stimulated renewed interest in the role of air-sea interaction in the MJO. And there's um, 
a paper by Weller and Anderson um, which has a, a figure similar to this but without some of the observations on it and um, uh, Hendon and Glick looking at the role of that and there are, there are a number of other studies related to this field campaign and the AC interaction in the MJO. So what I'm showing here are the surface fluxes. So if you just look at the black line, this is uh, the surface fluxes going into the ocean um, during this field campaign. And you can see regions where there's net heating of the ocean, quite strong net heating of the ocean, and then sort of little or no, you know, actually cooling of the ocean by the surface fluxes. And this, um, this, these periods of strong cooling of the ocean are associated with the active phase of the MJO, and this net heating is associated with the suppressed phase of the MJO, which is, this is, a, this is a rainfall. And this is the zonal wind stress. And so the suppressed phase of the MJO is characterized by very light surface winds, and so that reduces the latent heat flux out of the ocean and um, reduces the mixing in the ocean. So you tend to get a shoaling of the mixed layer, and that means all the sun that comes, solar heating that goes in, warms the ocean quite effectively, which is what you can see happening here. And you'll also notice that there's a very strong diurnal cycle during these suppressed phases. And then the active phase, you have very strong winds, so there's lots of latent heat flux out of the ocean. You have cloudy skies, so there's reduced shortwave radiation, which is these blue ones. Um, and uh, there's very strong mixing in the ocean, so you tend to take all that heat that's accumulated in the upper ocean during the suppressed phase and mix it down deep into the ocean. And so that has a, a cooling effect on the ocean. And mix cold air, cold water from below up. Okay, so motivated by this, there have been a number of modelling studies to explore the impact of coupling on the MJO. I suspect some of the motivation was also that it was much, more, much easier to run a couple model um, in 1990. Five, six, seven, eight than it was in 1989. Um, so this schematic um, kind of summarises how the SE interaction might work in the MJO. So here's the active phase of the MJO. You have easterly flow to the east of the active convection into the convection and westerly flow to the west of the convection and upper level divergence. Over the Indian Ocean and West Pacific, at the time the MJO is active, you have mean state westerly winds. And so the combination of this easterly anomaly and mean westerly wind to the, to the um, east of the convection means that you have very low winds and reduced cooling. And you also have nice clear skies, so you have lots of uh, shortwave heating of the ocean. So the ocean warms ahead of the convection. Um, behind the convection, you have strong westerly winds on a, anomalies on a mean westerly state, so you've increased the wind stress, you've increased the latent heat release or evaporation from the ocean, so that cools the ocean, and you also tend to have more cloud behind the MJ active phase than you do ahead of the MJ active phase, um, and clearly there's reduced short wave actually sort of underneath the active phase. So this tends to cool the ocean ahead of the uh, behind the convection and warm the ocean ahead of the convection. Um, and this warming ahead of the convection, if you just make an argument about convection likes to sit over warmer SSTs, um, would make sort of tend to favour the progression of convection over this region. I don't like that argument because you know, convection feels the SST through the surface fluxes and you've reduced the surface fluxes here. And so it, it's, it's not quite as straightforward as that argument. But there are good reasons to think that warming here might, for example, warm, a warm surface here might be in low, generate a low, uh, lower pressure here, and that would induce convergence, which could bring additional moisture in to the environment. What kind of attitude is changing the heat that you have So, on, so in, in, in a composite sense, it's about a quarter of a degree, but, well, no, a quarter of a degree positive and a quarter of a degree negative sort of thing. Um, in a in, in an individual, if you look at an individual event, because when you composite, you tend to average over the spatial and temporal variations in it. You can see anomalies of the order of a, you know, maybe 0 0.7, 0 0.8 ahead of the convection. And but is that really push you over the threshold that it's too cold for convection? Um, yeah, I'm, no, and I'm not sure there is such a thing as too cold for convection. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that, that's, again, a, a nice thing if you average, but it doesn't take account of the fact that 
the reason it doesn't convect over water that's 27 degrees C is because somewhere there is water that is 28 or 29 degrees C. If everywhere was 27 degrees C, you'd still have to have some convection somewhere. So I think mean, that's a bit of a kind of... <laughs> right, okay, so loads of modelling studies. Um, I haven't listed the mo modelling studies that show that coupling improves the MJO because virtually you know, 80, 80 or 90% of them probably do. But there are a number of studies that find results, contradictory results. Um, they tended to be longer ago, but there are a number of plausible explanations why SE, why these couple model of studies that find no impact might be right. Um, or why they might get this result um, and be wrong. So it might be that SE interaction isn't really very important for the MJO. Um, uh, Wojtek Grabowski made an argument, actually, that all air sea interaction is doing when you couple your model is making up for bad representation of, of the variability in the atmosphere. You know, you, you don't have very good representation of the variability in the atmosphere. You stick some variability in the ocean and the model responds to that. I don't buy that argument because it's quite a lucky coincidence that the way it responds to it is to produce something that looks like an MJO. Um, it might be that when you introduce coupling, the errors in the basic state... Um, actually degrade the MJO, or the errors that you introduce in the basic state of SST might degrade the MJO simulation more than the positive impact that you're getting from coupling. Um, it might be that there are, you, you just don't represent the ASE interaction processes in your model very well, either because you're not properly representing some of the important processes in the model. So that might be the mixing in the upper ocean, it might be the sensitivity of your surface fluxes to changes in wind because you've got too strong a drag coefficient in your model, or something like that. Um, or it might be that errors in the basic state, i.e. surface wind or e.g. surface wind errors, errors, lead to errors in the nature of the coupled feedback. How many slides do I have to go back? So if you haven't got a mean westerly wind in your basic state, um, but you've got an east mean easterly wind in your basic state, then that will tend to enhance the latent heat flux is ahead of the convection, and you'd get cooling ahead of the convection and warming behind the convection due to changes in the evaporation. And if that's the case, then your coupling mechanism is going gonna, is gonna to break down. Um, and the other reason is, if you've got an atmosphere-only model that's got poor intraseasonal variability in the first place, then you haven't got anything on intraseasonal timescales to organise the surface fluxes um, that will generate some kind of response in the ocean, and then you've got no way for that to feed back on the atmosphere. So if you haven't got anything to start with, then you might not expect to get anything back. Overall, the consensus now is that air-sea interaction does modify the properties of the MJO, but it is not critical to the existence of the MJO. The MJO is, is probably inherently an atmosphere a, you know, like a coupled convection dynamics coupled phenomena in the atmosphere and doesn't rely on air sea interaction for its existence, but the air sea interaction does modify the MJO. Um, so I mentioned this already when I was showing you these diagrams. During the suppressed phase of the MJO, light winds and clear sky conditions can lead to a strong diurnal cycle in sea surface temperature. Um, and so if you're trying to model those diurnal cycle in SST, um, what I should say is this diurnal cycle actually has quite a strong rectification onto the mean on interseasonal time scale. So I'm going to do this from close up. So if you can imagine, without the diurnal cycle in SST, the SST during this period would follow essentially the bottom of that red curve. Okay, because... Um, the diurnal cycle is really just enhancing the SST in the top metre or two of the ocean. If you put the diurnal cycle on, that tends to, the daily average SST will increase to some way, somewhere halfway up these spikes. And the impact of that on the, on the daily mean SST during the suppressed phase is actually, it elevates the daily mean SST by something like a quarter to a half of a degree. So that's quite a big impact compared to the underlying intraseasonal variability. It's about 30, it explains about 30% of the underlying intraseasonal variability in SST. Um, 
So obviously, if you want to capture that diurnal cycle, well, you need to couple your atmosphere and ocean on a time scale that is less than one day. And in fact, because of the way that the coupling is done in models, you really need to do it at least three hourly. Otherwise, you get some aliasing of the diurnal cycle, depending on where you are in longitude. Um, you need upper ocean resolution of the order of a meter or so, because the diurnal warming only really happens in the, in the top meter or two of the ocean. And so you need to be able to resolve that. Otherwise, the, the, the diurnal heating is distributed through five meters, the top five meters of the ocean, and um, it, you don't get a very big diurnal cycle. Um, and there we go. This is about the rectification of this diurnal variation onto the intraseasonal variability. Until very recently, coupled GCMs typically had upper, upper ocean resolution of the order of 10 meters and coupled once a day. So that's not going to give you a very good diurnal cycle of SST. So in 2007, I did some experiments um, at ECMWF to have a look at the impact of this poor representation of the diurnal cycle um, in a set of hindcasts for the Toga core in the ECMWS monthly system. And uh, these figures um, show the impact of that um, diurnal cycle coupling or diurnal coupling on the forecast skill of the MJO model for that, those, those hindcasts. And so, um, so here's, a, here's a thing that you should think about when you're plotting your, um, your forecast skill. You should have some reference. In this case, the reference is um, persistence of the MJO. Um, and so these are correlations for the, the two uh, PCs that make up the Wheeler-Hendon diagram. So if you just persist those PCs, you don't get a very good MJO forecast. Um, this is essentially a forecast in an atmosphere-only version of the model, where we persist the SSTs. And you can see. Um, even then, there was quite good skill at ECMWF out to sort of 12, 13 days for this event. The black line shows what happens if you use their monthly forecasting system of the time, which was coupled to a dynamical ocean with 10 meter resolution in the upper layer. They did couple every hour, even then. So, so they've got the diurnal forcing of the ocean, but they don't get the diurnal response. And then the blue line shows the, the skill um, if you um, coupled to just a thermodynamic mixed layer ocean, but that had very high resolution. So one meter resolution or 0.8 meter resolution was the top layer, and it had something like eight layers in the top 20 meters of the ocean. Um, and so you can see for, for this um, uh, component of the wheeler hendon index, there's a marginal improvement as we introduce coupling and then introduce the, strong, the, the diurnal coupling or the, the, the diurnal cycle of SST into that. And this is the phase of the MJO that essentially, or this is the PC that essentially describes uh, the variations between phase four and five over the maritime continent and phase eight and one over the... Um, this is the one that describes um, the phase which is active over the Indian Ocean or active over the Pacific Ocean. And you can see that for this phase in particular, we get some quite extensive improvement in, um, in forecast skill, uh, up to sort of five or six days increase in time for which we have anomaly correlations greater than 0.6. Um, many studies in forecast models which um, have introduced air sea interaction have found that it is the, 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 coupling over, the coupling really improves the forecast skill for those phases which are active convection over the Indian Ocean, West Pacific, rather than um, for the maritime continent active phase. So here's just a quick roll of basic state errors. So this is a paper by Pete Innes. Um, so this is Again, a regression type look at the, the MJO. This is observations in its OLR. Um, and this is when Pete did some simulations in the, a very old version now of the Hadley Center coupled model. And you can see that the, we have quite good representation of the MJO over the, um, over the Indian Ocean, but not very good representation of the MJO over the West Pacific. And that's because at the time, the, 
MJO, the basic state of the couple model over the West Pacific, this is actually a degradation compared to the atmosphere-only version of the model in this region, had uh, mean easterlies in, in the West Pacific region. So if he does a, uh, an experiment where he does a flux correction of the, of the model, um, then you can actually recover some of the propagation over the West Pacific because you've improved the basic state of the model. So this is sort of one example of how coupling might make your basic state worse and then you lose some of the impact of coupling. So back to a Klingerman and Woolnow. This is a different Klingerman and Woolnow. So we, you know, we've looked at the impact of air-sea interaction in the MJO using a, a high, this same high vertical resolution mixed layer model of the MJO. Um, we've done it in this model because it allows us to fully capture the diurnal cycle of SST, whereas the standard configurations of the Met Office model at that time didn't really allow us to look at that. And using the mixed layer model, it's quite easy to prescribe some seasonally and depth varying heat and salinity tendencies to the, to the ocean model, which allow you to maintain the basic state of your ocean model very, very close to observations. And that means that you, can, you shouldn't be changing the basic state of your model. And so you can really see the impact of air-sea interaction. And we've done this in both the high and low entrainment frameworks that I talked about before. In general, low entrainment simulations, the coupling improves the amplitude, but it doesn't really improve the propagation in the, in the, in the model. And in high entrainment simulations, coupling improves the propagation, but it doesn't actually change the amplitude very much. So here's some examples of that. So this is for an MJO, or composite based on essentially phase two um, of the MJO. This is where it was in phase two of the MJO. Um, I'm confused now what we're seeing, looking at here. It's OLR. Okay, that's good. So this is the active phase of the MJO, and this is the press phase of the MJO. Um, this is observations. This is for phase two, and this is for phase six. So again, I'm showing the phases where the convection is active over the Indian Ocean or the West Pacific. Um, this is for the control entrainment experiment, and you can see that this is the atmosphere only. Um, and this is the coupled version. And you can see we've increased the amplitude, particularly in this phase two, but not really done anything in phase six. But we haven't really improved the propagation signal at all. Oh, sorry. So this is time going upwards. This is longitude. And the, the zero is here. Sorry, the axes, they're grabbed from a paper. So the axes are designed for papers, not PowerPoint presentations, unfortunately. Um, if we go to the high entrainment simulation, this coupled low entrainment and atmosphere only high entrainment actually look you know, quite similar in a way. If we couple the high entrainment simulation, we actually see that, if anything, we slightly reduce the amplitude of the signal, but we vastly improve the propagation of the signal, both in phase two and phase six. Okay, so the impact of air sea interaction depends on what sort of MJO you've got in the first place in your model. Um, so I've kind of summarized that in these di diagrams again here, but in the interest of time, perhaps I won't um, dwell on this too much. You can see that in the control entrainment, we, we tend to increase the amplitude, but we don't really do much to the propagation. Um, in here, if you look at the right, in the right places, you can see improvements in the propagation. And so um, where's, where is the right place? So this, this one, for example, we tended to, to get slightly more propagation into the circle compared to this one. And this one is a, is a big improvement in the sense of you, know, you really extended that propagation. Um, you also seem to sort of improve the lifetime of the MJO event. Okay. I'd forgotten about this. Oh dear. <laughs> High resolution modeling of the MJO. So all the things I've been talking about have been in GCMs where we rely on our parameterization schemes to represent convection. Now recently there have been some advances in computing that allow us to do some simulations at, at high resolution where we can, we can allow the explicit model dynamics to deal with the convection. And there have been a, a couple of examples of that. Uh, one, globally, um, with the NECAM model in Japan, where they have now run simulations down to 350 meters globally in their model. Um, they don't run them for very long. Um, or regionally, where you force a large domain with reanalysis at the boundaries and allow the MJO in 
um, uh, in the model to to develop. And so there's a, an example of that by Chris Holloway and me. Um, right, so notes here. The resolution, apart from when you go down to 350 metres in NECAM, is still not cloud resolving. It's cloud permitting, but we're really not actually resolving individual clouds. Um, and so that means that actually we're, we're still not really rep representing the details of the convection correctly, but it is a very different way of representing the convection compared to a standard convective parameterization scheme. These models generally show improved simulation of the MJO compared to their parameterized counterparts, even allowing for uh, not changing the resolution. Um, it's still not clear whether the improvement relies on an explicit representation of the convection and the ability to capture the full range of scales, that should say, um, of interaction. So we, we're resolving from four kilometers up to 400 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers. And so the convection can interact with the dynamics on all scales. Um, and as opposed to a parameterization scheme where we, we don't allow the interaction of the convection with the dynamics on any scales less than the resolution of your climate model. Or whether it arises just because we've improved some representation of essentially parameterizable processes, e.g. the sensitivity to environmental humidity or the vertical profile of the heating. Um, so this is just a simulation from the Holloway paper. So this is uh, the same event that I was looking at in Nick Klingman's paper of the MJO during Yotsi. So this is just the first 10 days of that. You can see the eastward propagation of the convection. These are two simulations performed at 40 kilometers and 12 kilometer resolution with parameterized convection. And there's no propagation, really. We've also done a simulation where we've changed the entrainment rate um, a la Klingemann et al. by incre increasing it. And actually, you do see some improvement in the propagation in, in that simulation. Um, it's, and then these are four simulations where we've turned the convective parameterization off, essentially. Um, and um, generally they show some improvement in the propagation of convection. They're very, very noisy, and this is because we're not really resolving convection properly. And so what you tend to get is, because you're not, you can't resolve the small, weak convection because you need, you know, you've got to be convecting on a four-kilometer scale. What tends to happen is instability builds up in the boundary layer, and then it goes bang and fires off and, and comes down again. Um, but there's a general improvement. And if you look at this in these sort of Wheeler-Hendon phase plots, these three simulations are these three lines here. Um, and these are these three simulations. We do understand a little bit why this one doesn't show the same kind of improvement as these three. Um, OK. So despite everything I've said about how bad climate models are at simulating the MJO, we do have some skill in subseasonal prediction systems. So um, I'm, I'll talk a little bit about two studies. So this is um, a study by Frederick Vitard about the MJO in the ECMWF model over time. Um, and so this is um, the correlation, bivariate correlation, with between the forecast, ensemble mean forecast, RMM indices of the Wheeler-Hendon in index and um, the observed. And so this is the lead time at which the bivariate correlation falls below 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and 0.8. And so if, if you're sort of, you know, 0 0.6 is your measure of skill, then there's, nowadays, there's skill out to 24, 25 days for the MJO in their model. And that's, that's pretty good. Um, there's been slightly less improvement you know, in, the, in the 0.8 bivariate correlation, but 0.8 is quite a tough test you know, for, for a measure of skill. Um, and you can see that you know, there's been improvement over the years. It's not, been, um, it's not necessarily been sort of systematic, um, depending on where you look at in the threshold. So this is a measure of the correlation, but it tells us nothing about the amplitude of the MJO signal in the model. This is the amplitude error in the model. Um, and you can see that actually up to about 2005, 2006, there was very poor MJO amplitude. Um, and, and 
between sort of the 2006 operational system and 2008 operational system, the amplitude of the MJO in the model really improved. So this is an amplitude error of zero here. Um, and so Adrian was partially responsible for this improvement over this period. Um, and then he left. I did notice it's flat after you left, Adrian, yeah. Um, so, and, you know, many studies have shown that the MJO skill depends on the initial phase in the forecast. So this is just the variation in that forecast day for the 0.6 correlation, depending on which phase you've initialized. Uh, you know, if you've got a strong MJO in your initial conditions and which phase it was in the initial conditions. So those that are initialized in phase two or three or phase six or seven, which is MJO active over the Indian Ocean or West Pacific, tend to have slightly more skill than those that are initialized with the convection active over the maritime continent or sort of the sort of Western Hemisphere phases. So... Um, these errors in amplitude and possibly errors in the propagation speed do have an impact on the teleconnection from the MJO. So this is still from Frederick's paper. This is the composite of the North Atlantic surf weather, 500 hectopascal geopotential in the Northern Hemisphere, 10 days after an active MJO in phase three. This is what that looks like in the 2011 version of the seasonal forecasting model. And you can see that actually over the North Atlantic region and over the pole, um, it really is capturing the signal quite well. If you look over the Pacific, the signal is actually a little bit too strong. If you compare that to the 2002 version of the model, where you had very low MJO amplitude, there's also a very weak teleconnection response. And that's essentially because having that teleconnection relies on a Rossby wave that is generated by the heating. If you've got weak heating you'll generate a weak Rossby wave response and you, your teleconnection response will be weaker. And that actually has quite a significant impact on the NAO prediction in, in the ECMWF model. So th this is the correlation skill for the NAO prediction um, over ECMWF for cases where there's a strong MJO in the initial condition, which is this solid line, and no MJO in the initial condition. And despite the fact that we know that the, N the MJO is a source of predictability for the NAO, in early versions of the model where there was weak amplitude, it was actually worse at predicting the MJO um, than uh, the NAO than it was when there was no MJO in the initial condition. And that is essentially because the model was failing to capture the driver of the NAO variability in these forecasts. And so, despite the fact that it should be doing better because there is a source of predictive capability from the MJO, it was actually doing worse than if there was no MJO in the initial condition. As the amplitude improved, this teleconnection improved, and now the, an, a strong MJO in the initial conditions provides additional skill over the, for the NAO. So, Nina et al. examined this MJO prediction skill and potential predictability. The paper's mainly about potential predictability, unfortunately, rather than the skill. Um, in, this, in a comprehensive set of hindcasts from the ISVHE project, Intraseasonal Variability Hindcast Experiment. Um, they, they base their predictive skill on the time at which the mean square error has the amplitude, same amplitude as the signal that you're trying to predict. So this is quite a good measure of predictive skill because it is actually taking account of the amplitude because the, the if you have a weak signal, then your error will be larger. So this, this captures both amplitude and phase propagation. So this, the black line is the single member skill. So this is essentially a deterministic predictive skill of various systems. And you can see that ranges between something like, well, let's ignore CFS1, but between 10 and 15 days, maybe, for single member skill on average. The, the hash bars show the skill for the ensemble mean in a deterministic sense. You know, and, um, and there you can get skill for ECMWF up to 27 days, for example, um, um, but more generally around 20 days, perhaps, for most models. These bars up here 
show their estimate of the potential predictability in a sort of a perfect model scenario. And you can see, so the, the, the tan lines are sort of, should be compared to the black and these should be compared to the, to the hashed. You can see that, you know, in a perfect model potential predictability sense, which is perhaps an overestimate of the potential predictability, um, there's still quite some room for improvement, maybe. Um, and they find, additionally, you know, they find predictability limits, limits are lower if you have weak MJO in the initial conditions, so that's perhaps not unsurprising. Um, these are all estimates for, sync, for strong initial MJO conditions. And they find some phase dependence of predictive skill and predictability in some models, but not all. And the phase dependence is not the same for all models. So that figure I showed for Frederick's paper is not necessarily the case for all models. I don't know why I've got that figure twice. No, I'm in so summary, I've got, finally got there. So simulating the MJO in climate models is still a really big problem. And the MJO relies on an interaction between, well, because the MJO relies on an interaction between planetary scale dynamics <coughs> and atmospheric convection and is highly sensitive to the representation of convection in GCMs. I won't go over all the details there. AC interaction is important, but the existence of the MJO doesn't depend on it. Um, but despite weaknesses in, in model MJO simulations, operational prediction systems still do exhibit useful skill for MJO prediction. Okay, thank you.